It's hard to believe, but there are still people in this day and age who really think the world is flat. Yep, that's right. They think the world is flat. And some of them insist it's a key part of what the Bible teaches. Back in 1838, a man by the name of Samuel Rowbottom set up an experiment on the Bedford River in England. What he hoped to prove was that the earth was indeed flat, despite you know, thousands of years of evidence to the contrary. And sure enough, his experiment seemed to prove that it was. The concept was really pretty simple. There's a six mile stretch of the river, more of a canal really, that runs perfectly straight between two bridges. He decided that if you placed a mark on one of the bridges at a given height above the water, and then backed up to the other bridge and placed a telescope at exactly the same height, you should be able to see the mark on the distant bridge. At least you should be able to see it if the earth is flat. If the earth is round, however, six miles was far enough that the mark should disappear below the horizon. And sure enough, when they looked through the telescope, they could still see the other mark, which appeared to prove the Earth is flat. Now, why proving this was so important to Mr. Robottom, I really, really don't know. From what I can gather, he claimed that he got the idea from reading the Bible, which speaks about the four corners of the Earth, which to his way of thinking, meant the Earth was a flat plane instead of a round globe. Of course, that would also mean that the language of the Bible does not allow for figures of speech. But for the moment, that's really beside the point. Somehow, he came to the conclusion that people like Isaac Newton and Copernicus were absolutely wrong. And in 1881, he published a book named Zetetic Astronomy, Earth, Not a Globe. And of course, given the wild premise of his book, he published it under a pseudonym. He called himself Parallax. But the problem with publishing his theories in 1881 was that they had already been conclusively disproven in 1870. When one of his own disciples, a man by the name of John Hampton, put out a public challenge inviting people to come and prove the Earth was indeed a sphere. He even wagered the princely sum of 500 pounds that nobody would be able to do it. On January 12, 1870, he published an ad in the weekly journal Scientific Opinion, and here's what the ad said. What is to be said of the pretended philosophy of the 19th century, when not one educated man in 10,000 knows the shape of the earth on which he dwells, why, it must be a huge sham. The undersigned is willing to deposit from 50 pounds to 500 pounds on reciprocal terms, and defies all the philosophers, divines, and scientific professors in the United Kingdom to prove the rotundity and revolution of the world from scripture, from reason, or from fact. He will acknowledge that he has forfeited his deposit if his opponent can exhibit, to the satisfaction of any intelligent referee, a convex railway, river, canal, or lake. So, in other words, if you could prove the curve of the earth, he would pony up a considerable sum of money. But alas, for poor Mr. Hamden, a professional surveyor named Alfred Russell Wallace took him up on the challenge and publicly destroyed him. What Wallace understood was the principle of atmospheric refraction, which bends light and actually allows us to see just a little bit over the horizon. Refraction is the reason you can see the sun rising just a few minutes before it actually comes up. And it's the reason that stars in the sky appear to twinkle. It's the bending of light in the atmosphere. Wallace knew that the telescope in Rowbottom's experiment had been set eight inches above the water which enhanced refraction. So what he did was add an important element to the Bedford River that compensated for this atmospheric optical illusion. He put a pole in the water halfway between the two bridges, and he put a mark on the pole at the same height above the water as the telescope at one end and the mark on the bridge at the other. Then he put a second mark on the midstream pole just a few feet below that. If the Earth was flat, as Rowbottom believed, then when you look through the telescope, 
the top mark on the pole and the mark on the distant bridge should line up perfectly because they were the same height above the water as the telescope. But if the Earth was a sphere, then the mark on the pole should appear to be higher because the curve of the Earth between the bridges would lift it up. Sure enough, Wallace was right. Not only did the top mark on the pole appear to be higher than the mark on the bridge, so did his bottom mark, which is exactly what you would expect if the Earth is a globe. Appalled by the devastating results, Mr. Hampton refused to pay the bet and even ended up in court trying to get out of payment. The humiliation of losing this bet publicly was so overwhelming that Hampton went on to badger Wallace without mercy for another 15 years. In fact, he even issued death threats. So, in response, here's what Wallace wrote in 1905. He said that the wager, quote, cost me 15 years of continued worry, litigation, and persecution, with the final loss of several hundred pounds. And it was all brought upon me by my own ignorance and my own fault. Ignorance of the fact so well shown by the late Professor de Morgan that paradoxers, as he termed them, can never be convinced, and my fault in wishing to get money by any kind of wager. It constitutes, therefore, the most regrettable incident in my life. Now, here's what I want you to think about. For most of us, there's little doubt the Earth is a sphere. We've known that for thousands of years, and we've even pretty much known the exact circumference of that sphere for thousands of years, ever since Eratosthenes calculated it in the city of Alexandria. And I guess what I really want you to notice is just how deeply vested Mr. Hampton was in a very bad idea. He took the loss personally and spent years trying to destroy his opponent, and you've got to wonder why. What is it in our human nature that attracts us to wackadoodle theories and makes us so unwilling to accept any evidence to the contrary? I mean, I don't know if you've had any personal experience with flat earth people, but for some reason, I have a gift for attracting these folks. I, I hear from them all the time, and I know for sure I'm going to get a few letters after this show. And the one thing I've learned over the past few decades is that discussing this is a complete waste of your time. I mean, I used to slow down and talk to just about anybody with any idea, but I've got to admit, there's a subset of society I'm no longer willing to waste time on. Last summer in the Northeast, there was this guy who approached me after I was done speaking in public and he told me, man, I really, really want to talk to you. And I said, look, I'm a little busy because I've made some commitments this evening, but I'm going to be here for a few days. And so maybe on another day, I'll have a little time to talk with you after I'm done the meeting. And you know, my, my gut kind of told me he wanted to talk about something weird because, well, after almost 30 years on the road, you get a sense for it. So I probably shouldn't have promised him anything because sure enough, he proved very eager to talk. The next day, he approached me with a file folder full of photocopies and he said, I want you to read this. And as soon as I take a short break, I'll come back to tell you what was in that folder. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. You know, I kind of find it fascinating how people with really weird ideas will beat around the bush when they first start talking to you because somehow they sense... Well, you're going to reject them. And, and that's the way it was with this guy who approached me with his stack of photocopies. He started talking about a biblical commentary he'd read on the book of Ezekiel and how something in that commentary was bothering him. And he never quite got to the point until, I'll admit, I got a little bit impatient. I said, sir, what exactly are you getting at? And that's when he said this. Well, when I was in the Army, I worked in cartography, which of course you know is map making. And I spent a lot of time just thinking about geography. And well, I eventually noticed when I looked off the ship that the water in the ocean is completely flat. And it shouldn't be flat if we're sitting on a globe. This guy was channeling Samuel Robottom in the Bedford Experiment. And I guess at that point, I'd already run into enough flat earthers that I really did lose my patience. because. 
there were a lot of people waiting to talk to me about real issues. And so, sir, if you do happen to be listening today, let me apologize for cutting you off quickly. But please do understand, you are nowhere near the first person who has approached me with the flat earth and tried to convert me. And that's what I told them. This is flat earth theory, I said, and I'm sorry, I do not have time to talk about this. And so I took his folder of photocopies and I handed it back, which of course he wasn't happy about, it upset him. But frankly, I've learned that continuing that discussion is a huge waste of everybody's time. Oh, he said, you know about the flat earth? And he was skeptical that I knew anything. I said, yeah, I've been through this at least a hundred times, at least really, he said, a hundred times. I mean, he thought I was exaggerating, but I promise you, it's at least a hundred times. And I've discovered firsthand that no matter what I say to prove the earth is round, most of these people have a carefully considered response and they'll show me that I'm wrong. I mean, if you tell these people that the Apollo missions took pictures of a spherical earth, they'll tell you the pictures are manipulated or they only appear to be round because the astronauts were taking the pictures through a circular porthole. I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of proof you offer these folks. I promise you, you are probably wasting your time. And this guy with that stack of photocopies was really disappointed when I gave them back and said, sorry, I just don't believe it. Uh -huh. No, he said, I'm the one who feels sorry for you. And he stomped off and that was the end of the meeting. And I'm sure that given the current resurgence of flat earth theories, that some of you probably have similar stories. It's weird, this stuff is going around again. And again, the real thing I wanna ask you is why? Why do people latch onto this stuff like a bulldog and become so invested that they feel personally threatened when you challenge it? Why does something so unimportant seem so vital to these folks? Why? Do otherwise intelligent people suddenly put on reality blinders and tenaciously cling to something that doesn't make a lick of sense? Is there a fault in the wiring of our brains that makes us susceptible to these kinds of things? Is there a downside to the parts of our brains that help us recognize patterns? I mean, think about this. Pattern recognition is a really important feature in your mind because it helps you navigate the world and accumulate the resources you need. And recognizing patterns is also the reason that we can engage in any kind of empirical science. But that very useful function sometimes makes us see patterns that aren't really there, as in the case of pareidolia, which makes us see faces in places where there are none. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there's a famous geographical feature in Canada that you can find on Google Earth, and it's called the Badlands Guardian. From outer space, it looks exactly like the face of a First Nations native, and the detail is absolutely astonishing. I mean, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the hair, it really does look like somebody sculpted this thing on purpose, and it, it even seems to be wearing a set of Apple earbuds. I mean, go on Google Earth and look at it. It's one of the most convincing things I've ever seen, but it's an optical illusion. The parts of the landscape that appear to be raised are actually depressions in the ground and vice versa. The whole thing is actually inside out. And the reason it looks like a human face is because our brains are very, very good at creating patterns. Same thing happened with that famous face on Mars. When Viking One first sent a picture back to us, this feature looked exactly like a human face. But then decades later, when Viking Two went back with better resolution, the face was gone. It just disappeared. It turns out it was only there because our brains are so cleverly designed to recognize patterns. And I suspect that's a big part of what happens with some of these weird theories. The brain is remarkably good at taking unrelated facts and connecting them to the point where it looks like something you recognize. Then you add our natural predisposition to be aware of potential threats in our environment and boom, you suddenly have a global conspiracy theory. Now, I've got to admit for the sake of complete transparency that I really am a fan of conspiracy theories. Not, not because I believe them, but because, well, I find the phenomenon so fascinating from Area 51 to Sasquatch, from JFK to the Illuminati, 
I have a pretty good grasp of the nature and history of conspiracy theory. And I read these things for entertainment because, well, look, there's little doubt they're very entertaining. And for most of us, that's what they are. They're just entertainment. But when people start to take them seriously, and unfortunately, it seems like more and more people are, that's when the weird and wonderful suddenly has an impact on real life. And it suddenly begins to shape the decisions you make and the life you lead. And that's where it becomes a problem. It leads to horrible outcomes. It ruins friendships. It adds unneeded tension to marriages. It can lead to bad financial choices. And it can even endanger your health depending on the nature of the conspiracy. And one of the most tragic outcomes I've witnessed personally is the way that conspiratorial thinking can actually compromise the teachings of the Christian faith. Maybe some of you remember the satanic panic of the 1980s when suddenly it seemed like, well, there was a demon hiding behind every bush and there was this growing fear that satanic covens were multiplying like rabbits out there and doing unspeakable things in an effort to tear down the Christian faith and maybe even Western civilization. There were popular speakers visiting Christian churches, telling wild stories of having been a high priest of Satan or a devil worshiper who escaped and lived to tell about it. It was very popular. Now, look, there's no doubt there are some very strange cults out there. And I really do believe that some of them are dangerous. It's, it's true. But the stories that were circulating in the 80s really took the cake. I mean, take, for example, the story of John Todd. He became a popular speaker in a lot of churches because he claimed that he was raised in a family that practiced witchcraft. And by that, he didn't mean old world paganism like the Druids in England. He meant actual devil worship. He claimed to be a Green Beret who served in Vietnam, and he claimed that he had been initiated into something he called the Council of Thirteen, this high-ranking body of Satanists who were busy taking over the world. And from that point, he began to tie just about absolutely everything together. The Rothschilds, the Kennedys, the oil companies, the Illuminati, the entertainment industry, the government, everything, you name it. All of it, he said, was being secretly controlled by a highly organized and secretive group of Satanists. Elton John, he claimed, was using some kind of witch language to write his songs. And Ayn Rand had been told by the Rothschilds, he said, to write her books, and the Illuminati told her to spread her ideas. And John Todd really was just the tip of the iceberg back in the 1980s. There were others, like Mike Warnke, who said he had been a witch who was put in charge of a territory to spread the message of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Copies of copies of copies of VHS tapes were making the rounds in people's homes. Maybe you remember some of these. And these tapes somehow proved that somehow vast satanic networks were abducting children, controlling the minds of the youth, and slowly demolishing Christian churches by displaying occult symbols and placing hexes on church properties. Kids, you might remember, started playing their records backwards, looking for hidden satanic messages that only seemed to be there if someone told you exactly what you were listening for. I remember the amazing buzz that went through one town I lived in when somebody said, hey, a satanic coven went to a vacant church property in the middle of the night last night to curse it. We found a circle on the ground and now the church can never be built. Rumors circulated in my city that on Halloween, the hospitals had to post extra guards in the maternity ward to prevent satanic abductions. Now, again, I'm not saying there's no such thing as a satanic coven or destructive cult, because believe me, those things really are out there. But the idea that they're all connected in one grand conspiracy run by the world's Jews or the Illuminati, that's the work of overactive imaginations. And I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, 
there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. The real problem with the likes of John Todd and Mike Warnke is that pretty much none of what they said was true. Mr. Todd ended up in jail convicted of rape, and after he was released, he landed in a psych ward. Mike Warnke, who also did stand-up comedy for, for some reason, was exposed by Christian journalists who showed that he'd been making up the whole story. And at the end of the day, Christians and Christianity ended up with yet another black eye. We looked utterly foolish because we were out there selling these ideas, and the actual message of Christianity had kind of faded into the background. It reminds me a little bit of a story that you find over in the book of Acts, which interestingly enough also has ties to the occult. You find it in Acts chapter 16 where Paul is visiting the city of Philippi in Asia Minor, and he's plagued by this girl who follows him around announcing his presence. Here's what it says. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. Now, you would think Paul might be happy for some free advertising, because you know there's no such thing as bad publicity. But not so in this case. It continues again in verse 18, and it says, But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. So here we have a genuine occult practitioner, the real deal. And she's telling everybody to listen to Paul. This is a servant of the Most High God, and if you listen to him, you will find salvation. Of course, that was true. If you listen to Paul, you would. But Paul shut her down because this was a case of bad optics. She was the last person he wanted endorsing his message. She was actively discrediting him, making him guilty by association with her. And in some ways, that's what happens when Christians go off message with their conspiracy theories. They read a few popular books or they lay awake at night listening to Art Bell and George Norrie, and they start to preach what they're hearing as if it's true, and as if it ties into the Bible. Suddenly, there are hidden enemies everywhere, and we become obsessed with exposing the so-called secret enemies who are pulling the world's strings. And sometimes, sometimes, occasionally, wouldn't you know it, they prove to be right. Sometimes there are government scandals. Sometimes there are cover-ups. Sometimes there are plots to overthrow the government. Now, the real thing is seldom as juicy as the elaborate stories people weave or the complex charts they create to link all the powerful people in the world, but sometimes conspiracies do happen. I mean, of course they do. Just look at what happened to folks in Tuskegee. But the question Christians need to ask themselves is pretty easy. Is this theory the message of the gospel? Or maybe we should just ask the question, so what? What difference does this story make? Is there a chance when you find yourself drinking at the fountain of global conspiracy that you're actually causing harm to the cause of Christ? Let me go back to the flat earth thing for a moment. And I know this is one of my favorite subjects. More often than not, these people will talk about a global conspiracy where NASA is working overtime to keep you in the dark. But as you probe it, it begins to look a lot like all the other conspiracy theories. And occasionally, when somebody assaults me with their firmly held belief that the Earth is flat, I just ask them one question. What does it matter? Are you planning to go to space? Are you planning to launch a satellite? What does it matter? And that's the important question. I mean, it's easy to see why the existence of God would matter. If there is a supreme being and he has moral standards, that would be good to know. If you and I were created by God, that matters. But the shape of the earth, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect my life today. For 99.9% .9 of people, it doesn't make a lick of difference. And by wasting your time on foolishness, you may well be playing the role of the servant girl, casting shade on real Christianity. Most of the conspiracy theories that circulate in churches remind me of the advice Paul gave to a budding young preacher named Timothy. And he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge 
some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Apparently, the spinning of fables was already a problem in the early church. People were engaged in pointless stories and disputes, and in the process, they were experiencing the tragedy of mission drift, where they were no longer focused on the real message of Christ. I guess on the one hand, it makes me feel better about what happens today because it's been going on for a long time. But on the other hand, I've got to believe that the apostle was frustrated. Okay, time for one last break, and then we'll wrap this up. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Back in the earliest days of the Christian church, there were believers who started to blend the teachings of the pagan mystery schools with the teachings of Jesus. Today we call them the Gnostics, a word based on the Greek word for knowledge, gnosis. And the basic idea was this. It's a special group, the enlightened ones, who had secret knowledge that nobody else had. And of course, that was very appealing because who doesn't want to be part of the intellectual elite? The problem was their system of belief completely distorted the teachings of the gospel. And unfortunately, the same thing still happens today. I think sometimes people just want to feel important. They want to feel special. And when they get the idea that they're the only ones who understand the real nature of the world, that they're the only ones who can really see what's going on, well, that can be a little bit intoxicating. But the problem is this. It's not the message of this book. Conspiracy theorists like to preach things nobody could possibly know. You can just never prove them. They have a message about what people supposedly do out there somewhere in secret. And there's never any evidence, never any real proof. Just whispers in the dark. And anybody who dares to disagree with these folks gets written off as a shill for the shadow government or some other secret organization. It's a pointless discussion, and it has nothing, nothing to do with what it means to live an authentic human life. Listen, let me just say this as I wrap up. The message of the Bible is profound enough it doesn't need our help. And maybe it's time to pick it up, especially if you claim to be a believer, and read it and see what it actually says. God doesn't need us to add to it. This book gives you everything you need for an authentic life. Thank you for joining me. I'm Sean Boonstra. This has been Authentic. Mm -hmm.